Welcome to Deep Tech 315. I'm Gene Munster along with Doug Clinton. This is where we talk about the three most important things in tech once a week. And we have 15 minutes to talk about that. We're running the clock right now, Doug, and then we're going to jump right in. Our first topic is related to everything that's going on in the world that is catching all the headlines. It's heartbreaking to see these headlines coming out of the Middle East. It is uh, reminds me of a lot of heartbreaking headlines that I've seen in the last couple of years related to what's going on in Ukraine and also uh, makes me think about the potential, what China may be thinking relative to Taiwan and even more conflict in the world. And as uh, hard it is to do, to kind of step beyond uh, all the the personal uh, impact that the, these conflicts are having is to, to step maybe through that for a brief minute and talk about what it means for tech. And this week we saw shares of uh, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, uh, those up call it 10 plus percent. Uh, NASDAQ was up 3%. Also CrowdStrike, which is a cybersecurity company, up 13% this week. Pretty clear. Uh, both of those companies, or all three of those companies, uh, by the way, are either in the our Loop in, uh, Frontier Tech Index uh, or in our, our long only fund. And if we uh, think about the impact of this conflict, Doug, can you just maybe take a step back and give us a, a little bit of a, a history about what has changed in terms of how uh, uh, technology is impacting the tools that are used in, uh, in, some, of this, in some of these conflicts? In the old world, you know, companies like a Lockheed or Northrop that you just mentioned, they would sort of get orders from the military. The military would say, we want to build X fighter jet. Uh, there would be budget to do that, to figure out how do we create this incredible piece of technology, and fighter jets are incredible pieces of technology. Uh, and then these defense primes, as they're known, would go and they would do that. What's changed more recently with, uh, we can call them modern defense primes, or we kind of just call uh, emerging technology companies in the, in the defense space, defense tech companies, like an Anduril, uh, they actually go and they sort of do R&D like a traditional software company. They go and they experiment, they build products, and then they show what they've built uh, to the military, and they convince the military that this is something that they need and want. And obviously there's a dialogue there that even goes... Uh, into that before they go and create product. But companies like Andrew are really leading the charge. It's a $10 billion private company. We have exposure to it in our public-private hybrid fund. Um, it's one of the companies that we think is probably, especially given this conflict you just mentioned, one of the most important companies in the world right now in terms of thinking about where the world is going and some of the uh, unfortunate, I think, tensions that are going to be persistent here. Yeah, the, the tensions are going to be persistent. They're uh, potentially be increasing. And uh, just to kind of capture that arc is that uh, there's a consumer products almost approach that companies like Andrel are taking where they say this is the tech that we have and this is how we think it should be imp implemented. And then they show it to different governments to see if they'll buy. That's right. Okay. And are there, I'm just curious, if you think about their portfolio of products, Andrew specifically, are there things that are unique that we wouldn't have been thinking about five years ago? Well, really what they've done is they've created Lattice as their core product. It's, you can think of it as sort of an operating system for the battlefield. And what it does is it helps monitor and sort of combine everything that might be going on in the modern battlefield. So think about your old battlefield, you might have had some vehicles, air and ground support. You might have had some, uh, some people, troops on the ground. In the new modern battlefield, not only do you have that, you also have a lot of autonomous vehicles. You have drones, you have UAVs, uh, you have autonomous ground vehicles, and you even have perhaps submersibles. And so what Anduril is doing, and, and I think what maybe we wouldn't have seen if Anduril hadn't built it, is this concept of sort of a unified operating system that really combines all the pieces of the modern battlefield um, that I don't know that you know a Northrop would have created. Makes a ton of sense. Uh, we're just hitting the five minute mark, which means we're gonna go on to our second topic here. 
Thank you, Motor Trend, for publishing. I think they called it an investigated documentary. It was like 15 minutes long where they were talking about what's going on in Mexico related to batteries and EVs and how it potentially could impact the U.S. And as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about electric cars, autonomy, thinking about Tesla, how traditional car makers are, are building for that transition, I have this like great wall in my mind uh, it is everything that's going on in Europe and the West, and then there's everything in electrification and cars that are going on in China. And all of the success that I hear that BYD is having, I think that Ford and GM and Tesla don't have to worry about it because it's over there in China. But Motor Trend's reporting that over the past three years, China's made uh, a step up in investment. They talked about going from about $200 million a year, that's an M, not a B, to about $500 million a year in investment in some of this infrastructure related to um, manufacturing of electric vehicles in Mexico. So those numbers are still pretty small. Mexico is a small market. We sell about a million vehicles a year. The U.S. sells about 20 million vehicles a year. But if you go and look at some of the language in the recent adjustments to NAFTA, is that uh, to that uh, cars made in Mexico, if they're 65% assembled or greater, then they can come to the U.S. and avoid, it's like a 35 or 40% tariff. So the basic idea of this motor trend was, can uh, Mexico be the Trojan horse where eventually we get into uh, the U.S.? And I'm going to uh, save my opinion. I want to like you to go first, Doug. I'd like to have the luxury of going second. But uh, if you think about that and think about, let's just uh, fast forward. BYD is going to be probably building a manufacturing plant in Mexico. Tesla, of course, has talked about their uh, factory, a gigafactory that's coming up in Monterey. There's just more action going on uh, uh, there. And uh, play this forward and say uh, that we're going to have Chinese uh, electric car makers uh, on showroom floors. Uh, what do you think the reaction is going to be? Is, is is the U.S. ready for Chinese cars? I think it depends on the quality. I think as it often does. I don't know that um, just because they're Chinese cars that that would have a stigma or not. Certainly, there's a growing I think political element to that uh, that's worth thinking about. But I think. At the basis level, if the BYD cars are high quality and in particular high quality for the price point where they're competing, then sure, I think that they will find a market in America. But to me, it all comes back to quality. And, and the political point, I think, is interesting and worth thinking about. I saw a separate uh, study that basically suggested that a minority of Americans expect to buy an EV for their next car over the next five years. But if you looked in the data, what was actually the most telling was um, Republicans were much more likely to say that they didn't think they'd buy an electric car. Uh, people who were older were much less likely to say that they thought they would buy an electric car. And so I think there are factors beyond, you know, just is it, you know, from China? Will people not mm -hmm. want to buy it because it's from China? Quality matters and that matters, too. So we'll see. Well, I want to quickly talk on that those data points. Uh, Yahoo Finance reported, I forget who they worked with, but it was basically half the people they surveyed don't know what the sample size was, said that they would not want to buy or like strongly against or not want to buy an electric car. The number really surprised me. I didn't catch that nuance, and it does uh, surprise me that this trend over the last few years that all of a sudden an electric car says something about where you are at politically I, I kind of don't get it because I think it should just be a question about is is it a good car and is it uh, do you enjoy it? But here we are, and as you said, hyper political environment. We hadn't talked about this, our view on this, and I am in agreement with you. I think that eventually we're going to have Chinese cars in the U.S. In 1965, the thought of having Japanese cars in the U.S. would have been absurd. And uh, I think the same would have probably been true about some of the South Korean manufacturers 15, 20 years ago. At the end of the day, I think U.S. consumers want to get the most bang for their buck. And if, if BYD is able to do that, or Jack is another manufacturer uh, that potentially could be coming to the U.S., uh, I think that uh, people will set aside some of their political indifferences or their political biases. Uh, also, I, I think it's unlikely, at least in the next five years, that there's any five, 10 years that there's any sort of manufacturing of Chinese cars in the U.S. I think that just probably would cut across both aisles. People uh, right now, I just think the political environment wouldn't support that. But import is something different. 
we're coming up at. Uh, I want to. I want to interject one thing. I know we're on a clock, but I think this is a good tie-in. Uh, liquid death. This might seem odd when you think about what does something say about a consumer. How important is that? Everything says something about a consumer. Everything they buy, even if it's something cheap and no brand, it says I bought something cheap with no brand. I was reading a study about liquid death, which is basically just spring water in a metal can. That's the marketing pitch. Um, the reason that it succeeded, because most people saw it and they're like, this is the dumbest idea I've ever seen. You're, buying, you're paying more to just have water in a can. And, but that's exactly the point. It's a conversation starter is what this study was kind of talking about, this person was talking about. They said, if you have a can of liquid death, right, instead of a beer, what does that say about you? Well, you don't drink. That's, that's a question. Why don't you drink? Why don't you have a beer? Why do you have a can of water? That's odd. And so the point is, Anytime we're thinking about products, including cars being made in China, if you buy a car that's made in China, it does say something about you. And mm -hmm. as a consumer, you're going to have to be willing to accept that, aside from the quality factors and all these other factors. You're going to have to be willing to accept what that says about you. I think that's an interesting marketing challenge for BYD. It's really an interesting challenge for any consumer product marketing company, including every car company that will make EVs over the next 10 years. Makes, makes sense and gets us to our final topic here. We do want to try to, on a weekly basis, hit something related to AI. At Deepwater, we believe that we're just scratching the surface at the potential. We believe the substance of AI will ultimately uh, comfortably exceed the hype in the years to come, and there's going to be lots of ways to profit from that. So we want to briefly touch on what's going on in the chip wars as a reminder that both Google and Amazon are building their own chips. Uh, these chips are predominantly focused on their uh, for uh, their their product. Or they're trying to build these chips, and uh, they would be used for like their data centers and for their own uh, computing capacity. But Doug, uh, that's not where the story ends when it comes to big tech and chips. Microsoft is jumping into the chip game too. They have a chip called Athena that is rumored to come out uh, at their coming developer conference. And the bottom line is, and this is kind of something at Deepwater we've been talking a lot about more recently. Our view is that if you are a real AI company and you have a market valuation over $100 billion, I think you have to be building your own chips. I actually think it's an imperative that you build your own chips. Not only does it diversify you away from basically a single supplier right now, which is NVIDIA. NVIDIA has 85, 90% market share for AI compute, um, but it also gives you the opportunity to build chips that are custom tuned to the applications that you are building and that can help you drive additional efficiency. So Microsoft's in, Amazon's in, Meta also is in, Google's in. I think you'll probably see OpenAI do something. There was a story that they were exploring this too and I wouldn't be surprised if you saw some other companies that are maybe not as deep into AI as, as the ones we just listed, but on the tertiary, maybe an Adobe, maybe, maybe a Salesforce.com. I think you might see companies like that think about it as well. Uh, you threw out a, a benchmark there. You said a hundred million dollar market cap, billion, billion B. dollar, billion yeah. dollar uh, market cap or greater. There's probably what fifty companies that would fall into that category that potentially would it makes sense for them to build their own chips. Well, I, I, I would caveat and say real AI companies over, so like Coca-Cola, you know, they're, they don't need right. to build okay. their own chips. But if you are a technology company and you are a real developing, real unique proprietary AI technology, I think you should be building your own chips. Makes a ton of sense. The name of the show is Deep Tech 315. That's three topics in 15 minutes or less. I'm checking the clock here. Brian's holding it up. We're at 14 minutes. We're going to call it a wrap at that. On behalf of Doug, myself, and Deepwater, bye for now.